What is up guys, this is Larry with The Financial Lift and today we're gonna to be talking about savings, specifically building a savings when you're on a low income or working minimum wage and to do that fairly quickly. And when it comes to savings, you know, most people just want a savings account so that they don't have to have the stress of living paycheck to paycheck or that at least it brings some stability to their life. And with very little guidance on how to build a savings, you know, it's no wonder that 35% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. That's over 25 million Americans that have to worry about every time that they get a paycheck, how they're gonna to survive to the next paycheck. Now I'm gonna give my personal advice on ways to break that cycle, especially for someone that has very little income, you know, has, is starting from zero as far as their savings, and to do it at a relatively short amount of time when you compare that to, you know, living the rest of your life with having a savings or an emergency fund. Now the first step in all of this is to honestly evaluate why you're living paycheck to paycheck in the first place. You know, for example, you could have a spending problem, you know, you're just always out out there buying the latest like Gucci slippers, for example, or the other scenario could be you have an income problem. For example, if you're a single parent and you have three kids and it just feels like you're just not making enough money, that may be a different situation. But either way, you know, some people definitely have this mindset that really brings them down. If you're already demotivated off the bat and you earnestly believe that there's no way you're going to get out of, you know, living paycheck to paycheck then even if someone approaches you with a plan on how to build a savings and break that cycle, you're, you're already you know, not motivated to stick to that plan. You know, it's much more likely that you're gonna fail at that plan because you already have this mindset of just failing at you know, breaking that cycle. And on top of that, I think something that a lot of people need to realize is it really doesn't take too long to build at least a decent amount of savings. If you're just able to save $20 per week, so that's usually for a lot of people just eating out one less time or having to cut coupons or just really having to tighten their belt and make sure they don't necessarily waste food. You know, that $20 can end up building a $1,000 emergency fund over the span of just one year. So let's start with the spending problem and I'll touch on the income problem later. But if you have a spending problem, it's best to focus on the biggest parts of your budget first. You know, that may seem obvious, but just think about this. You know, if your grocery bill is $400 per month and your rent is $1,000 per month, then even if you reduced your grocery bills in half, you know, you reduced it by 50%, you know, that, that's going to take a lot of work to get to that point to reduce it by half. That would only save you $200 a month, but you compare that to if you could find a cheaper place that was even just one fourth less than what you're paying for, and you go from $1,000 a month to $750 a month, you know, that's saving you $250 per month, which is more than the grocery bill that, you know, took a considerable amount more effort to do. And on top of that, there's a reason why I used rent as an example, because housing typically is the largest part of most people's budget, especially when you consider that, you know, typically on average, it makes 35% of the average budget for a household. And, you know, the, the biggest way to kind of reduce this, that I believe anyways, is that I think a lot of people oversize their apartments or oversize their houses, whatever it may be, where, whatever their living situation is, they typically are buying more space than they need. You know, just an example, when I was younger, I used to live in a two bedroom apartment with four people. And so I shared a room with someone and, you know, I had a futon in there. And, you know, during the day we would just, you know, make that futon a couch and it wasn't that big of a deal. And the, the room felt bigger than it was. And then I would just sleep there and it wasn't a big deal. So the point I'm trying to get at is that people are usually pretty hesitant to downsize their living situation. And usually that's because they just think it would be too cramped. They couldn't imagine living at, without an office space or having to you know, room with someone, or maybe they're in a family situation. They couldn't imagine having to share a room with a kid, for example, or have their kids share a room. But the reality is, is people adjust fairly quickly. And then when you start to really think about the space that you use and how you use it, you know, you realize that you can multi-purpose things. Just an example, you know, you can have a couch and a coffee table in the living room and you can use that as a desk and you can use that as a dining you know, table, for example. For many years, I used the coffee table as a dining table because it just wasn't necessary to have, I didn't have the space. And on top of that, it wasn't necessary to buy a table and a coffee table. It was just more worth it to just have one coffee table and use that for everything. Now, I do recognize that there's a fair amount of people out there that would just believe that it's not realistic to downsize their living situation, especially if they have you know multiple kids and they have a large family, for example. But even that, I would challenge that idea and encourage you to at least entertain the idea of trying to downsize your living situation. You know, you may find a better situation than you think. And so there's two main reasons why I bring this up. One being that 
if you think about like, you know, I've known retired couples, for example, that have rented out their basement because they had a large house when they had kids and grandkids. So they have this large home built. But now that's not, you know, no one's coming to visit them anymore. Is that too sad to acknowledge? And sometimes in these retired couple situations, they have this basement that has its own entrance, its own lock. So you maintain that privacy. And that may be a pretty ideal situation more than you think. You know, the other thing I think people should always be thinking about is if you're living in a situation that feels cramped right now, but you're still living paycheck to paycheck, how is that situation going to improve five years down the road? You know, you're only going to start to grow, grow that space more and more as your kids grow up or as you begin to have kids. Maybe you don't have any right now. So if you're going to move to a bigger apartment or a bigger house, for example, but yet you're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, you're only going to dig yourself in a bigger and bigger hole. So it's better to get financially stable now so that way down the road you can pr better provide you know in the end if you're living paycheck to paycheck if you can rent out a place that's a hundred dollars cheaper per month that should mean within 12 months so a whole year that you should be able to save a thousand two hundred dollars now the next major category i think everybody should attack is food and that kind of breaks down into two parts groceries and eating out and when it comes to eating out you know especially if you're living paycheck to paycheck i think the goals anyways should be to cut that out entirely and I understand the sentiment of, you know, it can seem nice to eat out, especially when, you know, you're tired, you don't necessarily have anything at home to cook, or, you know, you don't want to have to deal with dishes, or maybe have multiple mouths to feed, and you're just feeling too tired. But the solution, and this kind of goes along with groceries, because when it comes to groceries, the major thing there is that, you know, there's, there's kind of this eye-opening stat that, in general, Americans waste about $3,000 worth of food year after year. So just think about this. If you get better at planning your meals and you can get better at making sure that you plan ahead, you prep ahead, you cook on weekends, for example, then there should be no reason why you're wasting that much food and there should be no reason why you're eating out. So that's kind of a big major item that you can cut out. Even if you reduce that you know, food waste by, by half, you know, that's $1,500 that you're getting back in your pockets from not having to waste on groceries. Now, last major spending category I wanted to talk about was transportation. And usually when you try to convince someone to, you know, cut off the car payments, you know, get rid of a car so that way they can save more, you know, they just view that as completely not an option, especially when they, you know, they consider that a vehicle is the only way that they can get to their job, which affects their livelihood. So how are they going to be any better off if they can't make any money without a car? But the reality is, is, you know, public transportation is something that I think a lot of people should at least consider. You know, I used to live in an area that had a heavy amount of traffic where basically it took an hour or an hour and a half even to get to work or to school or anything like that. And, you know, I, I tested out the whole park and ride system and I enjoy that very much, which is basically where you just get dropped off at a point and then you take this bus that ends up taking this long highway all the way to the destination you need to go to. And sometimes there's a couple of, you know, bus transfers that you have to do, but it's really not that much of a hassle. And the reason I enjoy this very much is, you know, a couple of reasons actually, is one, you no longer have to deal with traffic anymore. You don't have to deal with that stress. Two, you know, it's pretty cost effective. It's not necessarily that expensive to do. And when you consider the cost of saving on gas and car maintenance, you know, it's something that's very beneficial. And the last major reason is you get all that time back. You know, just consider this, that, you know, on average, people spend about one twelfth of their day in a car. So if you think about that and add that all up, over the course of a year, that's a whole entire month that you're just sitting in your car. So when you take the bus, that's time that you get back. That's valuable time that you get back. You know, you can take personal related things on your phone, you know, take care of banking or whatever it is. And on top of that, you can be looking for jobs on your phone. You can be sending out applications, you know, whatever it is, these are things you can be doing, but you, you know, can't do when you're driving, or at least you shouldn't be on your phone when you're driving. So public transportation is one option, but even if I give the benefit of the doubt to most people and say, okay, you do need a car in your situation, you know, I see so many people out there that think they need, you know, a small SUV, for example, or, you know, a 20 to $30,000 car. And it's always interesting to me that, you know, a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck, yet a lot of people are driving these, you know, $20,000, $30,000 cars, which typically on a five year, you know, loan, auto loan, you know, that ends up being about $360 per month or even all the way up to $460 per month. You know, I even found this example of a Toyota Yaris that was going for $10,000. And so over a five year loan, that would actually be $160 per month. And it is certified pre-owned. So that means, you know, you would be under warranty and you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about any major repairs. So if you just think about that, going from a $360 payment per month all the way down to $160 monthly payment, 
you know, that's saving $200 per month. So over the course of a year, that's $2,400 that's in your savings that you didn't necessarily have before. Or put another way, that means it would only take five months to save $1,000 for an emergency fund. Now, another thing I want to touch on real quick when it comes to savings and living paycheck to paycheck is a lot of people feel that, you know, it's the interest that's killing them. And I understand that sentiment, but if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, you can almost use it as motivation because if you're living paycheck to paycheck, that interest is causing you hundreds or sometimes even thousands of dollars over the course of a year. And if you're just barely making it, that means that if you were able to break free from that burden of debt, then you would be able to you know, pocket that interest that was going to someone else, for example. And I did just do a video recently on ways to get out of debt, but I try my best to go into detail on how you can almost cut that time frame in half in certain situations. And at the very least, why you should be motivated and that's not actually as difficult as you think. Now, for some people, it's actually an income problem. It's not necessarily a spending problem. And in those situations, the main thing I would emphasize is that you're gonna have to make short-term sacrifices for the long-term benefit of not necessarily having living paycheck to paycheck and living this financially you know, vulnerable lifestyle. So what I would suggest is, you know, I just made a video recently on you know different side gigs that anybody can do and don't necessarily require any education, but there's tons of videos out there or tons of articles, just Google out there side jobs or side gigs that you could do. And there's plenty of things that you could do. But in the end, it's going to require a sacrifice of time. You know, maybe you're in a situation where you have kids that are dependent on you, so you have to be there at night. Well, maybe that means that you can kind of figure out some kind of situation for working on the weekends or whatever it is. You know, you're going to have to kind of get creative with it, but there's going to have to be some way that you can fit some extra time to generate some extra income. Because if not, you know, the alternative that I always like to think about is how is this situation going to resolve itself down the road? Is this situation going to get better or is it going to, you know, remain the same or is it going to get worse five years down the road? And for most people, it's not going to get magically better. It's actually, if anything, going to get worse down the road. So in the end, I really sincerely hope that some of this advice at least helps at least one person out there. And I do recognize, too, that not every financial situation is the same and that people do have different values. And so I, I fully recognize that there's people out there that sacrificing time with their kids to work a side job is just something they're not w willing to you know, work with. But I don't necessarily think that that should be an excuse to not take a hard financial look at yourself. You know, you have to be honest with yourself and think, am I doing everything possible to improve my financial life? And, you know, in some situations that may be the case, but, you know, I think for a lot of people, there's always room for improvement. And so I think that's just going to require a lot of people to just take an earnest evaluation on their own life. So that's it for this video. If you found this video useful at all, or if you at least appreciate the effort, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like personal finance, business, or anything financial or economic related, please hit that subscribe button. And I hope to see you in the next one.